Folks, we are back with another episode of Drama Quest. I think this is episode 47. Uh, first, shout out to Zrel. Thank you for being our newest patron, I think, once again. So welcome back to the fold, buddy. And uh, with no further ado, today's episode, we're going to do uh, more Teak Talk today. So the big thing for Teak today is going to be talking about uh, the end, the last half of Velius and uh, the Luckland launch. I know you guys saw some propaganda out there from some other shitty YouTubers. Don't worry, we're going to set the record straight. And joining me today to talk about that, to set the record straight, is one of our raid leaders at Faceless Fury, Sloan. Sloan, welcome. Hey, how you doing, Zane? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, Sloan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started in EQ before we jump into Teak Drama? Uh, yeah, so like everyone, I started in 1999. I was a crappy half-elf paladin on Povar. Uh, I don't remember much. I was really young. I was like 14, 13 maybe. Um, I remember there was this guy in Triton, Duke Dunrick, the Cavalier of War. He was a paladin I'd always follow around. And I kind of just hung out in Greater Fate Arc, which was the auction zone, instead of um, East Commons on the Povar server. I just kind of traded a lot. That's all I did. And Played for a couple years, uh, probably dropped the game right around Planes of Power. And then I'd say around 2010, I was in college. Uh, I did a late college because I was in the military first. And a friend of mine who I would talk about gaming with, he said, hey, did you hear about this new Plastic EverQuest server? It was P99. So I kind of got involved in that, got uh, highly addicted, um, joined uh, Inglorious Bastards, I was in there a couple months, and I ended up getting um, voted out, essentially. Um, long story it has to do with Kinsad and his relationship with the GMs. I don't really want to get... Kinsad, not a fan of yours? I mean, so I had a roommate, and I had him play my um, bard, and he would sit in these commons, and if I wanted to trade something, I would tell him to trade it, essentially. And I was talking about it. I was with, like, Get Some and Kinsad and, like, a, a Freedy group. Which so I'd be guys back then, and um, I literally mentioned it that um, hey, I can put that on auction right now. I have a character in in uh, East Commons Tunnel, and within two minutes, I was uh, I was banned. So after that, probably like a week later, I came up for vote, and uh, one of the other officers, Perun, said it was like a forty nine fifty one split. I ended up getting voted out of IB, and when I got voted out, I joined this Euro Guild which ended up um, ironically merging into IB and making Transatlantic Rampage. Um, however, I quit at the beginning of Kunark to focus on finishing school. I uh, came back about maybe when the server was eight, nine months into Kunark, and I joined this guild called BDA, uh, Bregan Day Earth. And they were good guys. I mean, one of their, one of their leaders, I think San Luen, was a dev. I didn't know at the time. I found out later. And essentially what happened with that guild was um, they didn't really want to compete with TMO, who kind of owned that server after uh, Transatlantic Rampage uh, quit. And I think they went to EQ Mac. So TMO owned the server for about a year in Kunark. And there was a split in the guild. Like I'd say a good like 30% of the guild wanted to compete hard and the rest did not. They just wanted to be casual. They were happy with getting to raid once every two months whenever TMO got suspended for something. I think the GMs would suspend TMO just so other people had a chance to raid for a week. Is So is this the story of how Forceful Entry was created? Yes. And essentially what happened is a bunch of us got together. We kind of got fed up with it. Um, there was one week where TMO was suspended and we wanted to go to VP. And the leadership of BDA would not let us go to VP. And I made a joint raid. I PM get some. And some IB people came back and together we did VP and they kind of blew up at me. And that's when we split and I took the open world people and I made forceful entry. You know, I know you didn't know me back then, but that was when you got on my radar because I followed the forums closely at that time. And there was a ton of drama when FE first came out. But I also remember there was like a lot of it seemed like a, there was a lot of respect for you guys right off the bat because you were a significantly smaller guild than TMO. And every other guild had just rolled over to them at that point. So it was, it was good to see someone finally competing with them again. Yeah, no, it was fun. It was, it was very difficult at first. I mean, we were, we had low numbers. We didn't have any gear. We didn't have the experience TMO did. 
and we were kind of just starting to snipe things in sky like the 3d a couple of vs's we sniped um, you know what i remember the most uh, the, the, the weirdly is i remember you either had like a john snow or a rob stark forum avatar at the time yeah it was john snow yeah yeah <laughs> so like even to this day you know like how you have like a mental image associated with every person and you're like mental tribe when i think of you i still see that john snow avatar yeah i remember um it was a thing we all did it was actually like a joint thing tmo and fe we all all put up um game of thrones avatars it was like episode it was like season three or four i think in the good old days of game of thrones before it got destroyed yeah and i remember like circan uh pm me and he was like how did you know i, I had no idea what happened with Jon snow at the end um i hadn't read the books but obviously the people who did knew so People thought I made that my avatar because I knew how it was going to end, but I had no idea. I just liked the character. That's awesome. I so, a lot of in them, you know. After you did the FE thing for a while, where did you land next? Well, did the FE thing for a while. We ended up dominating open world. Um, anything out of uh, outside of VP for two to three months, TMO did not get a single kill. Like maybe maybe one or two. Um, and what ended up happening is we got into VP, and VP was. It was crazy. It was 48 hours staying up, train teams, training other train teams. So FE train teams, training TMO train teams, trying to keep them dead so that we could engage a dragon. And we would have to not only kill their train teams, who we knew by name, it was like Necreus and Dark Death and Alpha, and it was a couple others who were always there. But we had to kill their clerics that were camped in the lava tubes and their, you know, their support to res the train teams. And once we felt that we had the train team on the opposing side dead, only then would we bat phone. Everybody was pre-camped at the entrance. We'd pull the dragons to the entrance. Pathing on P99 was very different than TLPs. There was no leashing. So if you tagged, let's say, Drushk, uh, Drushk would literally run all the way, just path straight down the fastest way, not go through any walls or anything, just to the zone in. So it was very easy to make massive trains. And back then in P99 Blue, there was no rules in VP, supposedly. I don't know if you want me to get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. We don't have to We don't have to do the P99 episode, but it, it is nice to see your chops and that you, you know, cut your teeth in a, in a pretty competitive atmosphere there. Yeah, so, I mean, after, after all that, basically, I uh, ended up quitting, ended up moving to DC uh, to do, you know, be involved in the real world again. Um, and I kind of, the plan was to merge with IB, had a little falling out with Gitsum. No offense to him. I like the guy. He's a wonderful player. I'll play with him again. Um, but I ended up taking the guild FE and telling them to merge with TMO, which was another weird twist. And after that, I quit for about 10 years. Well, I think it's good. Like the merge with the TMO thing, some people would think is crazy, but it's always good when, when the competition is over, you can step back and be like, okay, it was just a game. And, uh, now we shake hands and you know what I mean? Move past that part, right? Like you can always look back and respect the guys that you hated the most when you were competing are the guys you respect when you're done competing. Cause you're like, you know, they really, they really got down that whole time and you can respect what they were doing for their team. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And I, I think a lot of people forget that this is a game and the people that go hyper competitive, um, but then the perspective of being, of it being a game, if this was the real world and there was someone who had, millions of dollars and someone else who had tens of dollars, I would kind of be suspect about the distribution of wealth there. But in a game, right. um, it really doesn't matter. It's it's a game. So I take all my competitiveness and hardcoreness out, you know, in EverQuest and have a more, you know, nuanced and, you know, egalitarian approach to, to real life things. And I think people should, you know, kind of understand that this is not serious. This is not life or death. Like speak world. for yourself it is life or death for me okay it's still real to me damn it <laughs> no but there there is legitimately there are like vendettas you know what i mean that have grown over the years between some of these communities and there's people who you can't you almost can't imagine seeing eye to eye with them anymore but we'll see what happens in the future so sloan i don't even remember i know we we talked on quorum was that the first time that we actually met or did we meet before that i think that was the first time we met gotcha, yeah that was but the first time we met did you know me before I talked to you? Uh, I think when I started getting, because I started getting back into EverQuest around, um, I played a little bit in Mangler. Um, I was in this guild called like Planner Expedition. I, I don't, actually, I was in the guild with Sazabi. Me and Sazabi were officers. Okay. Um, it was just a random occurrence. 
and I played a little bit, not much. I played through Kunark, nothing hardcore. Um, and then I played again on Mischief, and I was an elf sim. And I think during the Mischief time, I started watching some of your videos. So yeah, I did know who you were. Gotcha. I think I talked to you, and of course, I knew who you were like right away, I think. And um, I remember I was in high keep sending you tells and shit. And I think I just talked a ton of shit about beef to you. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, because I was in that, I was in Mayhem, Beef Skilled. He ended up quitting for real life stuff pretty quickly. Yeah, that was early on Quorum when we thought there was going to be like a lot of comp- competition on the server. You know what I mean? And we were trying to make moves against Mayhem that was looking to be the competition. Wow. Crazy looking at how that all turned out. Yeah, I think I, I told you something along the lines of I didn't want to join Faceless because uh, I wanted to be in the guild that was the underdog or something. Yeah. yeah. And that, uh, I mean, that brings us to, to Teak. I think that's a good segue into Teak. So you joined us near the end of Kunark on Teak, right? Yeah, I think the last two weeks of Kunark, yep. Yeah, so for anyone who's just catching up here and you haven't heard the previous episodes, right? Like Teak launched, Faceless went hard. We got all the server firsts in Kunark. It launched in Kunark. And uh, most popular TLP launch ever. The server had to be like upgraded several times. So huge player base. We got every server first by a mile the second guild didn't get any raid kills until like a week or nine days after we had killed everything and uh and then though we started losing more and more frequently in open world so we slowly were getting pushed out of open world until uh by like week four of kunark we were really only getting open world kills if it was like a poop sock that we happened to win or if it was like in the wee hours of the morning and we caught somebody slipping because I mean, basically what happened from, from my perspective and we had a whole guild meeting about this with all the members um, was like the, the competitor guild, which is RI, they were slower to level, but when they caught up, they were willing to what we were, what we were calling camp sock. Like they would just go, into the the zone of the mobs that were in window and just kind of hang out there you know what i mean stand around or camp right there and chill at character select and kunark mobs they die really really quickly so if you can't get on them at the same time as your competition you're just you're gonna get blown away so at first we we had a few socks with them like actual like 100 people sitting there you know what i mean and I, I told the guild initially, I was like, hey, like, we're not going to be like a socking guild. We're not going to do this all the time, especially not for Kunark loot. That's just garbage anyway. Um, but we're going to do it a couple times in the beginning because we think they'll just stop socking. You know what I mean? If, if they lose a few. But they didn't stop socking. So we we were very firmly like, we're not going to do that. And we were just getting, you know, we would we would get to every mob and it would be way too late. By the time we had two groups, they would have like 10 groups on it. Um, on top of that, we were not taking the hoop meta seriously, but they were hooping using Evander soups pretty, uh, pretty consistently. And they had access to a raid tool modification that we did not have access to. So this is going to sound minor, I think, but basically we had this raid tool or they had this raid tool where you could press one button. It would invite your whole guild, which you could always, you could do that with the guild window anyway but you could also just invite dps or you could invite tanks and support and healers so you could instantly get all your dps for a dps race in the same raid and then you can press group and it automatically distributes the raid into relatively well-balanced groups like melee dps with bards a healer in every group all that kind of stuff so when you're talking about the mobs that are dead 120 seconds after the bat phone very challenging there i remember there was this one venerable sat there where we we got there and we were engaged roughly at the same, same time, time as them and uh we lost and for us it was like i look at the raid window at the end and it's just like 70 people in the raid window not one person in a group you know what i mean because it's just too it's too slow to build the groups manually and trying to get people like i was like thinking the whole time i was like dude how are they getting their people so disciplined that they're just forming pre-made six mans like is their roster so consistent that the same exact people are logging in forming the same groups every time and then we found out about that raid tool and i was like this makes a ton of sense and the reason we found out is because one of our guys joined them and i was like so what are they doing you know what i mean that's different than what we're doing he's like he's like there's something weird about when they invite for raids 
they have to do two invites and then everyone's like in groups. And I was like thinking about it. And I was like, I remember hearing about this. So he, figuring all that out was a, a big change for us. And we were figuring that out about the time that you were joining Sloan. Yeah, I think you guys had it all figured out like maybe a couple days after I joined. Um, Cause I remember that, remember I came from P99. So I don't, there were no raids on P99. You just formed six man groups and it was six man DPS groups. Yeah. Wow. And I think we also noticed that on patch day, we always like performed significantly better than them. Like there, there were multiple times during Kunark where we would just stomp in V chance peak on patch day, which V chance peak is a full spawn on patch day. I remember this one time. Uh, I think you were with us by that time, Sloan, where VP full spawn and they, they, we got five of the six dragons. Oh uh, yeah. Not only was I with you, we, we planned that together. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was a, uh whole pre-plan of uh it was maybe like four yeah like four or five days after i joined i remember trying to do a raid especially a kunark raid which the mobs die so fast and having to use the normal raid tool which is just a garbage tool yeah yeah now in these expansions honestly kunark kunark is is where it is absolutely the biggest right because like half those mobs there's no mobilization you poured in talendor is right there right like there's no time to form anything at least in luckland valleyus you know, if you're clearing over to like R and R, you got a few minutes to form groups. But I do remember that, uh, yeah, you came in and you you advocated very hard for uh, for doing some of that pre camping stuff. And we were like, okay, let's make like a small group of people who are really into that, and we'll do it. Because I was also we were stuck in that position where like, if if we called for people to camp, people would be like, but you said we wouldn't we wouldn't pre camp Kunark stuff. You know what I mean? Like we had to like balance that atmosphere. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I don't want to say it was brutal. It wasn't that bad, but it was pretty bad, the situation. Um, basically, yeah, when I came in, TMO, TMO <laughs> I have enough flashbacks. Uh, RI was um, pulling 50 to 60 people. Uh, every time a VP dragon spawned, we were pulling 25 to 30, including a couple boxes in there. Yeah. So they def- they had double our numbers. And when I saw that happen, I just realized there's there's nothing we can possibly do other than getting to the mob faster than them. And that's why we started pre-camping up top. Yeah. And, you know, when we did pre-camp up top, we started actually competing. Towards the end, we were going one-to-one with them the last week or two. Yeah, um, for I mean, for like a week and a half, two weeks, we had a, a, the hidden Koth mage, right? Like that we snuck up there in the middle of the night yeah. and you would like Koth one person and camp it so no one saw that we were coughing an army and then we would just log in, you know what I mean? Behind, basically behind silver wing and have a whole raid there already. And, uh, they eventually caught that and they put their own cough mage at PD. But at that point, Kunark was basically done. Yeah. I mean, mostly they did do that one time. It just didn't work out for them that well. Uh, they're not very good at coughing, uh, or very quick at it. I should say, uh, what they ended up doing just the sheer brute force is they, a lot of them would camp before the voice room. Um, and they would run out, and some of them would die, but a bunch would get through and they would just bring the train to us essentially. And because they yeah. had so many more people, um, they were able to recover faster. They were able to just get things done faster. And there were multiple times where they killed both the raids on purpose just to, which is a fine strategy. I'm not the kind of person who cries over training. I think it's part of the game essentially if you're getting competitive. Yeah, but I think so. I, that, I think, yeah. That was the strategy they would use. They would just run up, try to wipe everybody and wouldn't care if they wiped their own people and they would recover faster, more people and get the kill. Um, yeah. But eventually we got after, you know, we started rolling and I got to know the people who was reliable, who wasn't, who was going to be there, who could do what. Uh, within a week of uh, pre-camping, we were going one, one-to-one with every dragon we bat phone with them, which was pretty impressive considering they had double the numbers. Yeah. Now, when, when we had that first guild meeting, when we started to lose a lot of open world, and I told members like, hey, we're not going to pre-camp. We're not going to sock Kunark dragons against them. And I, I assured everyone, I was like, you guys will see in Valius, this will all change. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll really be coming out. And uh, our roster and our play style will be much more formidable in Valius. And I said that, but I, you know, I was hoping that that would be the case. I wasn't a thousand percent you know, positive that that would be true, right? Um. But I knew we had that time to work on it because Kunark loot truly doesn't. It's just terrible, right? Especially with the tower gear and everything. So I remember you and I were talking before Velius, and I was like, honestly, dude, it wouldn't surprise me if we if we have the same numbers in Velius bat phones that we get right now during Kunark bat phones, which would be untenable. You wouldn't be able to kill really anything. Yep. Especially, and then yeah. 
uh, Valius bat phones were just like boom, seventy two people every single time. It was it was incredible. Yeah, it was wonderful. And yeah, if it was anything like the Canark uh, numbers, it would, like you said, be impossible. Not only hard to kill it in an isolated instance with just your own guild, but no way, no shot racing. So do you think that was just because people, um, do you think it was because people just didn't care about Kunark loot? They were not willing to log in and, and get get the feet moving for Kunark gear? Well, it's hard for me to tell because I, I joined the last two weeks, so I don't know what happened. I mean, I know you guys, I know Faceless was winning the first week or two in Kunark. Basically, you guys leveled faster, uncontested. You were winning anything they contested. And then, you know, like you said before, they kind of just took over the, the rest of Kunark. And uh, I don't know how that affected people or anything like that. But if I had to put a bet on it, I'd say people just didn't really care. I mean, what could you possibly get in Kunark um, at that point? Like Robo Bazaar Sky and Crown Ryle and maybe Gray Suede Boots? Those are the That's only it. Those are the three. Those are the three items. That was it. So, yeah, why, why waste your time and energy doing all those kind of shenanigans unless you know you have some serious problems like me and the 25 people that logged in the vp at two in the morning for bad phones yeah i think one good thing that happened was our core became a lot more solidified over that couple months too like everyone who was willing to quit over losing vp dragons for a couple of weeks quit you know what i mean everyone who couldn't take couldn't stand losing a few dps races quit our guild and joined ri yeah that makes sense it wasn't a ton of people it was like five people and uh I think that helped. I think that helped in the long run. And I can only imagine those the, those couple people who went over there and now they have to sit there and like hold on to L's all day every day. But so Velius <laughs> we're going in, you know, we did our launch strategy, which was huge. Um, we pretty much worked exactly how we wanted. And then we took a couple days off. We were like, hey, we're not going to do open world raids. Just get your shit figured out, right? While we knock out DZs and stuff. So I think it was like Monday mm-hmm. after the Thursday launch that we started open world. And our plan originally was just like, hey, let's do Vulax and AOWs, right? Because we were like, we're, we were thinking we were probably too slow to mobilize on these targets and get time on target fast enough, right? Yeah, I think, um, so if I remember correctly, initially open world started very slow. We did get uh, we did get a, one or two Vulax. Um, and I think we, after the first week, like towards the end of the second week, beginning of the third, we actually started competing because we were doing a lot of tier two clears in North Temple just because the tier two tier two gear, um, some strange reason, no one was farming it. Everyone was farming the tier ones. You had easy yellow axe, easy torm axes, right? So that tier, yeah. two, tier two gear was actually harder to get than the tier one gear at, at, a, at a point. I mean, especially coming freight, like your your first couple of weeks into uh, Vulac, I'm sorry, uh, Valius, all that tier two gear, every single item is an upgrade for everybody, right? It's like exactly, yeah. No reason not to do it. I do remember us winning most of our contested races those first two weeks. And and then... They did, but then they leveled their wizard army. Yeah, so they had leveled that before, and we kind of wondered why it never came out, right? Because they were bragging, like, oh, we got like 90 wizards that we leveled during the EXP bonus. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was like a two-week period where they didn't raid in Kunark, like in the middle, where we had an EXP bonus, and they all leveled wizards during that time. And then they never really brought them out in mass. And then one day we were going for a Vulak, and we had been winning a lot at that point and suddenly uh i think it was ansel ansel's like hey they just brought 60 wizards to vulak and i was like uh we're probably not going to be able to do anything about that one yeah they and literally for, had like, box wizards in a circle around vulak it was pretty impressive yeah and so then for like probably three days straight we lost every single mob yep and uh we we knew we pretty much knew that that was going to be the case right but we're like hey they the, fortunately they they busted these guys out like four days before the memorial day exp bonus right that was when it was yeah exactly yep yeah so we were like okay well we're just gonna have to take this on the chin for a couple days and we're gonna tell the members the whole memorial day exp bonus we are not doing any open world raids we're gonna do our dz raids and that's it and during that time expectation is that if you care about open world rating you are rolling a wizard or a shadow knight to max level and uh we i don't i wasn't confident how how well people would come through on that because we had already had a, a DKP bonus for epic monks and, and wizards in Kunark, right? And I never saw a huge result from that. But well, yeah. you, you can go ahead and tell tell us what happened. Yeah, I think, um, like I said, I wasn't there until the last two weeks of Kunark, but based on everything I know, I think the original large turnout for the Velios launch, a lot of those people got back into EverQuest you know, racing, because it was a race, the launch race. 
and we did do phenomenal. Um, and that spurred them to do open world. And we actually won the open world fights that we had the first uh, week or two. We didn't have many because we weren't focused on it, but we won them. So that kind of got people logging on, getting into it again. And then when RI came with their wizards and just destroyed us for a couple of days, people got pissed off and they actually wanted to be more involved and they leveled the wizards. And ironically, the twist is we said wizards and shadow knights, very few people leveled shadow knights, which turned out, we might talk about this a little later here, but they turned out to be like the gold standard in Velios. Um, yeah. They, was, they were like better than, better than the wizards yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And it was totally unexpected. Like most of the people leveled wizards. I say it was like an 80, 20 split. 80% of the people who leveled boxes leveled wizards. And honestly, dude, the real sleeper agent, if we had known, like if we could go back in time, fucking bards, bro. Oh yeah. Bards showed up huge, but that was towards the end when, when the fights were 60, 70 seconds. Yeah, uh, and we, we for compete, people, but, uh, yeah. For people listening, we had we had a few King Tormaxes that were thirty seconds long. Yep, and you're not you're not beating a bard who dumps uh, six or seven dirges um, in thirty seconds. It's it's not going to happen. No class will. So towards the end, everyone started realizing bards were, were the thing, but it was already the end anyway. I mean, we didn't even raid the last week, so yeah, but yeah. I mean, basically from there, we had our our wizard leveled and. Um, Right after the Memorial Day um, XP bonus ended, we came in hard and we we won AOWs back to back. We won Vulak. Vulak had a much longer spawn time. AOW was every day. We won like three AOWs in a, r- a row. We won the Vulak. We picked up a Tormax, which we normally never went for. And I think the big table turner was when we uh, killed Tunair. I don't think they were expecting us to be able to actually race them on Tunair. Uh, I don't think uh, we were expecting to win that um, from the comments I, I got from you, if I remember. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, out of nowhere, we just took it from them right in front of their faces, uh, mobilized just as fast. And I think that's when the table started to turn. You know what? I think what did it was all the trash talk. It, it pissed everybody off and made them really want to work hard. Because there was, there was a moment, even after we had the wizard army leveled up, where we were still content to be like, okay, we're just going to we're gonna get all the AOWs and all the Vulaks. And if anything else is up, like left up, we'll smash it. But we'll definitely get the Vulaks and the AOWs. And then people would be like, well, you guys have killed zero CTs. You guys have killed zero Yellenax. You got, you, you're done zero two nairs in open world. And every time they would say that, we'd be like, all right, well, today we're doing, we're adding this to the list. And then oh, it would the never come off was, the list. Yeah, the funniest was, um, how's that guy's name? Um, Eighth, right? He said something in the EverQuest forums. And that guy's just weird to begin. Like, he's the guild leader of Rampage, but he spends all his time with RI. I don't understand how it works. It is what it is. Um, but he said something in the, uh, official EverQuest discord about how we, we haven't yet killed CT. And an hour later we beat, we beat, uh, RI and killed CT <laughs> and uh, right. it, was, it was pretty comical. But from that point on, we killed every single CT for four weeks. They got one. I yeah, think it basically became a situation where it was like, if faceless showed up, faceless won. Yeah. And uh, there's, I don't know why, like, look, I don't, I don't hate the RI people, I don't even disrespect them. I actually respect quite a few of them. I like their fight. I like how hard they try. I like how competitive they are. One thing I don't like as to what you said before is just the the needless like shit talking and just the drama they cause. I mean, I'll, I'll train sometimes not like out of nowhere as, as a counter train, if that makes sense. Like if we're getting trained, I'm not going to sit there and take it right. I'm going to go right. back them in the same way. But they'll do shit like they'll just train us after a boss is dead. Like they'll we'll be engaged and it'll be at like fifty percent, and they'll run up with a train and a timby. I mean, they'll just do you know shit like that, which I kind of feel is uncalled for. And I think they did that so many times leading up to this that it pissed so many people off, and it got a lot of old faceless people who normally don't do open world involved too. And they came back and they're very good players and they went hard as well. Right? Yeah, we started like getting Reese and and Seeger coming to open world and stuff and. I started getting a lot more involved with it too. It was just like every all a lot of big names came out and and had a lot of fun. But yeah, you know they're, they're doing what I would call like tactically irrelevant griefing. Oh yeah, like, what, what did I say at one point? I remember I made a joke about it. Um, I forget. Um, something about like w- what a toddler think would think um, a good you know like a good strategy is essentially like it's, it seemed to me they were their own worst enemies with all the like very intricate design plans they were doing like pull this mob here and the timby here do this do this do this and literally all you had to do was just just win the dps race and right they couldn't do it 
And I mean, we'll there was time in TOV where they weren't even contesting us, right? We were pulling like a Dagarn to prep for Vulak later in that day. We pulled Dagarn at a certain time so that when Vulak spawned, we couldn't get trained with Dagarn. And for everyone listening, spoiler alert, Vulak does not have a window of variance, okay? Have fun with that. He has an exact to the second spawn timer. So um, we pulled Dagarn. And Vicious is there. They're not contesting us. No chance they kill us or wipe us or anything. He spams Dispel on Dagarn so much during the fight that, that the mob aggros him and kills him. Yeah, that, that was another thing. It's it's like on Avatar of War. So I think of the like maybe like 25 head-to-head Avatar of Wars. It might have been like 22. I forget the exact number. It was a little north of 20. Um, there was only one of them that they actually killed Idol and Statue. Uh Every single other one, we killed Idol, we killed Statue, we started the whole encounter, and the whole time they were there dispelling the mobs so we could not get them slowed. Because you try to land a slow on those guys without um, Tash and Mallow, it's, it's not going to happen. Right, yeah. Um, it, it makes I, Idol very hard. Yeah, and I mean, I, I get the reasoning behind it. that They want to wear us down so when Avatar pops, um, you know, our clerics, our tanks might have died, some of our DPS might have died. I get it, but, you know, once or twice, but that literally turned into their only Avatar war strategy. And to me, it's pretty pathetic that if you've done that 22 times and you lost 19 of those times or 18 of those times, I mean, you just got to try something else. You know what I mean? Like, don't keep hitting your head against the wall. And I think ultimately that's why what happened in the middle of Velios happened is they just kept hitting their head against the wall, not believing what was happening in front of them. And it just kind of, their people burnt out. Yeah. It was always good to see them roll up with characters named like Faceless Tears and uh, Raceless Fury in as like an alt guild come to these these races and they lose like every single time. <laughs> You're just looking at this this sad looking Faceless Tears character with no loot. I love the competition. I love the like I said before, it's it's all a game to me and it's it's great. Um, I just think some of those guys, they, they take it too far in how much they actually care pers- on a personal level, which is strange to me, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, what I'll say is this. In in 12 to 18 months, everyone who was doing a lot of open world between both guilds, um, except for maybe the leadership of RI, because they lost, um, but everyone else will look back and they'll be happy about how things went on this server and they'll they'll think about it as having been a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I'm I'm having a great time. Like I said, I took like a 10 year break maybe 12 from competitive EverQuest. The, the last two servers, the last two TLPs I did, super casual, just kind of did the DCs, kind of learned how TLPs work. I was actually in RI in on Vaniki, so that one wasn't that casual. But like I said, I didn't know much about how TLPs worked. Um, I kind of was just running around as a monk. Vicious was showing me a couple tricks here and there. And, you know, I wasn't anything, you know, uh, the caliber that I was now it's it's very weird coming from p99 to tlps it's you think it's the same game it's not totally it's almost a totally different game it's totally different and vice versa when we went to project quorum we didn't know anything about the emulator style of gameplay and it's it's weird how it's like you're in the same zone but everything is just totally different yeah but, but yeah wrapping up Belios, i mean so they you know were basically uncontested the first two weeks um what was contested we won and it was only a trickle of mobs we're talking like two or three, like Vulak and uh, maybe one or two, two avatars of war, um, two Vulaks, two avatars of war. And then uh, the wizard, you know, box thing happened. Um, oh, and, and the hoop thing. I mean, the hoops, another, like I just said about training as a countermeasure, the hoop thing was a total, you know, countermeasure as well. I mean, they were coming. I remember when we first saw them over there at Laguna, there was like 40 of them and it was like five of us. And I remember a bunch of, you know, people in the guild were like, why are there so many of them? Why aren't our guys getting these hoops? So that's when we started saying, hey, you guys got to get the hoops. If you want to win, we got to match what they're doing. And then that whole hoop drama started and it turned out in our favor because even though we didn't level a bunch of SKs, we had a bunch of SKs and we had really good SKs. Um, And uh, it turned out that, you know, hoops do much better on SKs. And yeah, I mean, it was was a good turn of events. But at the end of the day, when we started dominating, we weren't winning by 10, 20, 30,000 damage. There There was one Avatar of War fight we won by 190k. I mean, that's, right. that's not hoops. That's, that's just getting outplayed. Right. You know, you remember, so like they campaigned for hoops to get like nerfed or whatever, which eventually happened. But when they deleted Lanuga, especially when they deleted her the second time, 
we we started after a couple of days we started to get tells from their members complaining about us having hoops still because they had burned all their hoops in the first couple dps races and they were like it's real suspicious how you guys are still you still have hoops what is your exploit you know what i mean like and this is a recurring thing with with their guys they always think that whatever thing we're using to to get a leg up must be a cheat well, yeah, I mean, if you cheat, then you're going to think the only way everyone else is doing things better is if they're cheating too. That's, right. that's basically it. It's I mean, like, no, we just had, a, we had a, we had like five guys who all they did was get a bunch of hoops and parcel them to everybody in the guild and all of our alts and we shared banked them. And then we only let Shadow Knights use the hoops because they were more effective pound for pound on a Shadow Knight. Exactly. Yep. Pretty much. Yeah. And I mean, that um, was pretty much it. I mean, we, well, so there's one thing I wanted to touch on, which was the you know there's a video that came out talking about how how ri you know beat us right and and i would say like ri got more open world kills but th- that's like because there was a lot more kills that they got early on where no one was competing with them when we look at contested kills where faceless and ri met and competed with each other right faceless got 72 dps race wins ri got 13 yeah. Yeah. So similar. I I don't think that like, what do you say to that? Right? Like, I think that pretty much tells the story when we showed up, we won. And the last half of the expansion, we showed up most of the time. Yeah, I mean, anyone can make assumptions that lead to the conclusions they want. Um, it's not hard. Um, I mean, I don't know in EverQuest, you know, drama world, if people aren't in tune with that, but basically um, I watched that video and the guy is just making an assumption about what he wants, comp- you know, competition to be, and he's calling it the most open world kills. And in my mind, competition is when two people are fighting, not when you just have free crap, because at that point, why aren't DZs competitive? Put those in the mix too, right? Right. So if I were to tally it, I would tally the head to heads. The only thing I will say about that is it is a little hard to find to see or to, I guess, um, weigh in on if a guild is not showing up because they're afraid afraid of losing, right? So that's one, you know, iffy point about that. But at the end of the day, when you're at a seventy to thirteen or seventy-two to thirteen ratio, that doesn't matter. It's clear who the winner is. It's clear who's winning the competitive races, right? Yeah, um, you know, and you know what I have to say. I actually started to develop a little bit of respect for those guys because like they were still coming out three times a day to lose DPS races for, for three weeks straight. You know what I mean? I was amazed. Like, I think I said it a couple times how just phenomenal I thought it was that after three weeks of literally losing, like, cause remember some of those 13 had the heads, they were counting that week before Memorial day when they, they won like five, six in a row when we didn't have our boxes ready. Right. They had theirs ready and we didn't, if you take the numbers after that, it's much worse. It's like they won like six or seven to like 55 or 60. It's, it's crazy. You remember that um, AOW that we lost because one of our bards fucking cast the DA song on his yes. group instead. Yes. Oh we my lost God. 20,000 damage. And one of our bards DA songed, and it was the whole SK DPS group. Um, Emotional damage, dude. Yeah. That, that definitely, and yeah, for people who don't know, I mean, you know, people think DPS, they think wizards, I think monks, uh, monks fell off, like, and still they're, they're not up there yet. They'll be back. But, but yeah, I mean, SKs were basically battle wizards. Um, yeah. And uh, that's what we told them is you're just wizards in armor. Like, don't even think of anything else. You're not to die. You're not to tank. You're not to taunt. You live the whole time. So your, so your damage counts and your battle wizards. And they were, you look at parses from back then, top 20, 12 to 15 were SKs, the rest were wizards, right? Until Bard started stepping in, of course. Yeah, Bard just like randomly take the top three slots. But yeah, I mean, in regards to that video, and I mean, it's just kid stuff. I mean, making your own metrics and then saying you're the winner. I mean, none of that matters to me. What what matters to me is the actual in the heat competition. Who's winning the actual fights? Who, when they show up, do you know? You know, does everyone in that instance know these guys are probably winning? What do we have to do to? maneuver around them because back to the beginning i was in that situation with fe and p99 we were the underdogs we, we didn't make up fake metrics to say oh we we won these mobs in this instance and we're the winners like no we were losing until we started winning head-to-heads when we started winning head-to-heads and the competition started getting afraid and not coming that's when you knew who the real winner was yeah i mean hey momentum's a real thing and if you can hang on long enough to reverse your fortune a little bit you know what i mean a lot of people who are really competitive are also really delicate 
and when they start losing, they just fade away quietly. And um, I think even though as a guild they kept showing up, I think we saw their force become like a lot more box heavy. You know what I mean? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, they 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 were relying on, and that's another thing. And so back to the weird stuff people say. I mean, I, I've seen you know on the official EverQuest Discord. Oh, you know, Faceless has these boxes and Harai has these boxes. I, I don't know where this stuff is coming from. These people just make this crap up. From what I've seen in the actual field, uh, when they started losing, they started relying more on boxes. And that was a big problem. I don't think they anticipated because a real SK or even a real Ranger now is going to outperform a box SK or box Ranger 10 out of 10 times. It's it's yeah. not a competition. 100%. And the Faceless people are all real people. Like we don't have boxes in the DPS raid. Every now and then, like someone who, if we didn't couldn't fill a seventy two man, you know, we'd put in like my SK or someone else's wizard. But we're talking about two or three, maybe four, and those would quickly drop the second a real person logged in. I think we're, we're also talking about like between three a.m. and ten a.m. You yes. know what I mean? That's the only time that we have boxes in the raid. Yeah, and I think for them it turned into they were pulling 50, 60 people, and they had to rely on boxes. And that's nothing against them. I respect them for actually still competing in the, in that environment. Like you said before, that's it was just a phenomenal thing that they were showing up every day when they were losing ninety five, maybe even more of the targets. I mean, there was two weeks where they they won like three out of like everything that spawned those two weeks. Yeah, it's it's weird because like in theory, right? You you slap seventy two DPS from both guilds on a mob and there was a ton of times where this happened where we're both just standing at Yelenak waiting for him to spawn or some other mob waiting for it to spawn it should be a coin flip right it should be a 50 50 more or less but the the margin was way way out, out of their favor and i think that was because by the time it got to that it was it was after they had they were not fielding 72 mains you know when we first came back i think they were like even though we were a huge force motivated when we first came back with the wizards, that was when things were closest and it got worse and worse from there leading to Luckland, which I guess we'll, we should segue to Luckland now where it's like, I feel like I'm dealing with a different guild. So like, yeah, our Luckland, I don't know what happened to them. I mean, uh, and like I said, I was in there before and I, I know how um, competitive they get and uh, it's, it seems like it's just gone. Like it seems like their fight is gone. Uh, and honestly, they, they should have done, what they're doing and i guess we should say what they're doing essentially is they're, they're just not showing up like period like they've shown up to what three fights so far and luke has been out two weeks is that uh, right i'll pull up the numbers it's more than that right they did uh they lost one two they they lost like two or three today but they won two sarus against us yep and they won that mini so i th i want to say they've won three contested and uh they've lost three contests are so they yeah they've won and lost here's my sheet they've they've won three contested and they've lost like four contested okay so they've shown up to seven out of how many total spawns probably like 40 or 50 right oh god yeah um there's there's there been over a hundred spawns i have i haven't updated it with my my shit from today but uh as of last night when i went to bed there had been 102 open world spawns in the first two weeks of uh of luckland and that's tier one and tier two now note that both guilds have bat phone tier two so tier two in luckland is like full of worn attack gear focus effect gear it's very important gear so it's not like it wasn't kunark or or even valius where you could sort of defend only doing tier one shit you need yeah, to be farming tier two it's is phenomenal like, especially because you know th things changed i guess um i, I don't know much about TLP competitiveness, but from what I understand, rarely was there a server where people had three different characters that they would log on at different times for different things. Is, is that correct? Or That's it... true. Yeah, yeah. Usually you box them if you had multiple characters, but now it's like you've got personas to gear out. You've got characters that you're camping at different targets. Yeah, most of our guys have three different characters, and that doesn't mean they box. That means that we'd have someone camped at Tormax. We'd have someone camped at Yelenak. We've had the other person camped at you know north temple or gulag or whatever have you right the, the big um, thing was always like different demands right like you keep your monks camped at tune air or ct because they're melee heavy fights you keep your wizards at everything else your shadow knights at everything else and, and you I, see I the same thing here we, uh, i think that's back to that canark thing real quick the tunara turning point i think that's why we won that one we shouldn't have won that one 
but we noticed pretty quickly that wizards were completely ineffective against Tuner, and yeah. they had their wizard army. And that fight, they brought their wizard army. And yeah. they had more people than us, but we had a monk army. And yeah. we completely demolished the, the parse and took it. Yeah, Tuner has real low AC, too. She's perfect for, for monks. It was their one time to shine. Yeah, and I mean, you know, part of that strategy is back to P99. That's what we did in P99. I mean, we had, we couldn't box. Like, I, I didn't break rules on P99. I didn't box. I didn't use any programs, nothing. Like, um, but I had, I literally had 11 characters, uh, level 11 60s with epics camped at different targets. And the guild was required to have multiple characters camped at different targets. So it's kind of weird that it's turning into that, that meta. Um, it can only go so like far it. in that direction on TLP because of eight week expansions. You know what I mean? Yeah. L- luckily, the wizard, the SK is dying down. I'm sure they'll be back. I'm not, I've never actually played past Lanes of Power, so I don't know. But the wizard is, is good for multiple expansions. So, yeah. That now, was to a give people a perspective, to like you've got a Shadow Knight, a Bard, a Monk that you never use anymore, a Wizard, and a Cleric, right? And a Ranger? And a, yeah, and a Ranger and two Mages. Yeah. And I've got a. T- a technically, I, I ended up just loaning these out because I don't box. Um, but I've got two Clerics, a Shadow Knight, three Wizards, a Ranger, and a Mage. And I I stick to my my main character Zade, and I just swap through the personas as necessary. Like it, you know, I'll respond to a battle and be like, "Hey, do we need the cleric, or is it like contested? Do I need the wizard?" And just it's it's really it feels good as a player to be able to come with what the team needs at the time. You know what I mean? So, a hundred percent. And you know, all those characters you listed of mine and, and yours, like I hate boxing. I, I despise it. I wish there was a way. To end it but unfortunately i think the only way to end it is to not have a game like everquest where the combat is so uh so slowly planned out like it's hard to box in wow because it's faster paced you, you can't really do it as well um everquest is like the perfect game which is unfortunate because it'd be a much better game without it in my opinion that is um but yeah i mean we just have them all to switch for what's needed the only time i really box is um if it's a not contested raid um or if it's an easy character, like SK was very easy to box. All you had to do was press on Holy and hit number one if you bound and drain soul to that. And that's it. <laughs> like, it was done. Yeah. Uh, and Ranger in this expansion in Lukeland is just as easy. He box like a cough mage, not to fight with, but just to, you know, get shit exactly. moving. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, we, we arrive at Lukeland. And our Lukeland launch plan has many steps that mitigate... Um, griefing like actually when we went on test server and we did our test emperor raid we took our real emp kill team that we planned to use on launch and we fought emp and i brought three extra monks into the fight and i said you monks all i want you to do is break mezes and fuck around in grief and try to steal wraiths if we kill emp all like i want you guys to do everything you can to make us wipe or steal the wraiths at the end of the emp fight and that was the condition we practiced under and we were prepared for on launch day you know what i mean and uh EverQuest is very much a plan ahead type game. Um, and we definitely planned ahead for Luke. <laughs> like we spent so much time thinking about what they were going to do, how they're going to come at us, expecting that our I guild that we thought was there, you know, to be there. I was so surprised that they just said, nope, we're not doing anything. Like they didn't show up at all. And it was just amazing to me. Here's what you're going to notice, dude. Like our eyes good at some things. But the the they are bad. They're really bad at the leadership part. Like the part where you have to coordinate people to do things as a team, terrible at. That's why they leveled slower in Kunark. It's why it took them forever to, to get keyed. It's why they got outplayed on Velius launch. It's why they were the third guild to clear Luckland, not even the second guild. Like they're they just i think it's laziness i think that they don't care enough to do the micromanaging that we do like our luckland launch plan now that we've done it and i hope to never do another luckland again we'll see um we had characters we had a bunch of people on on like box accounts that they like everyone was playing their main right eventually but if you had another account you were using that account yep and what we did was we we knew that taskmaster pouches would be a bottleneck because they're pretty rare for some reason they seem more rare on mischief style servers than normal so we popped like 15 dz's of Sra temple with 10 to 12 people in each dz 
and every team was directed to kill com one kill comp two kill all the taskmasters kill rag one and then go up to the top and kill the three com three mobs by emps room and then you, we, we pulled all the key parts traded them to a, a main roster that we were willing to go in with 40 if we needed to but we ended up with like 55 and we were able to kill emp within like three hours or something and it could have been faster Oh yeah, we could have done it uh, much faster. Like when we realized that we didn't have any competition, we kind of just didn't put the brakes on, but we started going a lot slower. Yeah. Sure. Oh, and we, God, remember before launch, bro, when we were like, we, we had to get a, a DA idol for every person in the planned and parade in case, like we expected that the the first thing someone would do would be key a monk, put them in Emp's room, and that monk would do nothing but sit there and aggro blood every time a guild approached open world Emp forcing you to have to DA through the 20,000 damage traps that are in the EMP prep room. So we, we a whole raid of people that had DA idols so they could DA through the traps and we didn't have to use them. Yeah, I remember the debate, which was went on for a couple of days of whether we should even bother with open world because we were 100% positive it was going to be grief. Yeah, actually, we were we were not going to do it. Like that was it was leaning that way for a long time. Like leave open world emp, and we could just protect open world emp to make it hard. But we didn't want to risk killing open world emp and ri coming up and, and getting like twenty of the rifts right, and then they get to skip the whole emp process and go right to VT. Yeah, so or any compete. Yeah, any other guild for that matter. But it just uh, surprised us that there was not that there wasn't any griefing, but they just like didn't show up at all. Yeah, no, and I think. I think it was a smart move for them um, because they weren't going to win. It's just the bottom line. Um, I think what they did in Velios when, and like I said, I, I don't know if it was disbelief at what was happening in front of them or what. I mean, I've never seen in any competitive game someone keep going after just getting shit on over and over again for so long. But I think that was the wrong move. And I think they realized that a little too late. And I think the approach they took in Lukelin was let's be a little easier at first and kind of ease people into it. And that's why we see them starting to come out now after about two weeks. So yeah, now they have uh, they've been coming out. So first they they bat phoned an imp, and then just tried to chaos wraiths. Right, they got like um, twenty four rifts from an open world imp. They bat phoned another imp a couple days ago, and well, they they bat phoned like the third imp and didn't get enough people in to compete. Then they bat phoned the fourth imp open world. And they, they, I mean, it was a whole like 90 minute shit show of like spawning traps on people. Well, that was fun. Use, yeah. Both raids had to use bards to DA oh, their raid that. one by one through. Can I talk about that a minute? Yeah. Dude, tell the whole story. Oh yeah. That was great. No, I, I actually love this stuff. Like th this is like EverQuest for me is this hyper competitive, like almost a first person shooter of like chess right. game, right? Um, and I understand that's not what it is for a lot of people, but this is what I enjoy. And yeah, basically um, we got three amps. Um, before this last one, the only thing they did was come to take the rifts, which is valid. I mean, why wouldn't they? Um, and this last one, they actually competed. They actually had a force there. They could have killed it alone if, if they weren't contested. And what happened is we got up there around the same time. We went in. They set off the trap. They killed a bunch of us. Some of their members went in, and they also died. Not anywhere near as many. I think actually Seeger lived inside there, and he was alone in the cubby for like five minutes before Vicious trained blood on him and killed him. Right. Kind of funny. Um, and what we ended up doing, both guilds, is we ended up moving bards from group to group. Um, bards would play their DA, DA song. That group would run in, get past the trap because they have the bards DA. The bard would stay outside of the portal, of course, and they would go to the safe spot right outside the door. And then next group, next group, next group. And that, ha that was about, I want to say, a good five to eight minutes, something like that, of uh, both of our guilds. And at some point, a critical you know mass was there of each guild they probably had around 50 we had about probably 65 in there um and uh i think uh mabu aggroed blood and the timby to try to just you know he likes chaos like to mess up the situation so blood and uh the war the guards around blood they all pop down to the zone in for a second and then they warp back up and when they warp back up they immediately aggroed because they didn't warp to their original spots they walked up kind of and they they popped up on top of us and so, you know when he when he aggroed them did you notice they all ran in different directions i did yeah that was so it was so weird to watch that and i think he made it back up into the room pretty quickly didn't he he did 
Yes. Do you remember, was he on his rogue or what was he on? Rogue. He was on his rogue? Yeah. Yeah, so he probably was able to just like uh, hide sneak up real fast. Uh, I guess. I mean, I, I wasn't paying close enough attention to make any assumptions, but yeah, he got up there and he was there um, for the fight for sure. So Yeah. Um, so anyway, keep going though. But yeah, so basically everything popped on us and it was one of those situations where we knew it was going to happen. We were going to have to do the encounter. They were just going to sit back and try to win the, the final DPS race. We fully anticipated that the mezzable mobs were not going to be able to be kept mez, which is exactly what happened. They broke the mezes, which is fine. Like I said, not crying, valid strategy, especially if you're a gorilla competing. Um, so we were ready for it. And basically we kept everything under control. We killed blood. We had people off tank the, the ads that we couldn't mez. And um, the slowed ones were obviously easy to tank. Kept it under control. Got ready for amp. Got in the cubby that everyone always waits in. And about 30 seconds before I'm spawned, they all ran out and just sat on top of his spawn. So in these kind of situations, you want to be where the other DPS raid is always. You want to be on top of them so they don't get any kind of edge. So we went out there, we sat on them, Emp spawn, and I've never seen Emp bounce around so much. He was literally dancing around the entire room. Just like the amount of push was incredible. And it was intentional, of course. Um, if you push Emperor back into the cubbies, he will reset. So I think at a point... Uh, probably around 50% is when the push got really bad because I think they were looking at the numbers and they saw that we were vastly out DPSing them and they tried to push him into the cubby to reset him. Luckily, yeah. we had training on that <laughs> a couple days ago or the day before. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that next. What okay, we'll we'll we for that? Okay. Um, so we knew what to do and we knew how to counter push at that point and they were not successful in resetting EMP and we ended up out DPSing them. It was probably 70 to 30 um, in terms of 70% of the damage that was us, uh, 30% was them. Uh, last 50% though, I don't think they were trying to DPS. I think they were trying to push. Yeah, they, they, I think they gave up on the, like they had Rangers pop a true shot and shit, but then when, when it was clear what was going to happen, they went all in on the grief, which is kind of normal MO for them. Yeah, I mean, it's, look, if you're an underdog, you use what you have to to win and they tried it, it didn't work. I'm sure they'll try it again. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what the next one. Every every fight is like you know, up the meta a little bit, and then we got four of the five wraiths. It was pretty good. Yeah, definitely. So we got a lot more of our characters in. I mean, I have all my mages in. I have all my characters in, except for like three or four now with the like of the ten. So that just gives us a lot more maneuverability in in a in a VT. Now we told our members like the whole last month of Velius that in Luckland. All the bosses in VT and some of the bosses in Sra, if they're pushed out of their rooms, they death touch, then they warp to their starting point, drop all debuffs, and reset to 100%. And we said, our competition's core strategy will be to push this shit out of the room to reset the fight, to wipe you, and get a clean DPS run of their own. And even though we told everyone this would happen, it had to happen, you know what I mean, for people to be like, oh, yeah. So Mini Otten spawned. Was it was it like it was like a late night Mini Otten, right? Oh, it's all a blur at this point. Um, I think it's like yeah, some some not like super late, but it was a, a later evening uh, Mini Otten spawn. We got there first, clean engage. She's at like seventy percent, and then Tally Fur and a few other people pop down and just uh, start shoving her out of the room with with stunts and knockbacks and uh somebody grabs a bunch of mobs and trains them into us and then it was uh, like a for us it was like we're trying to recover but they had their whole raid just waiting for the wipe to happen and jump in you know what i mean so we lost that mini otten that was our our first mob that we lost in vt yeah our, no, I mean, it, it, it's, our, that might be our, the only mob we've lost even to this time right yeah, it's the only VT mob we've lost him. Yeah, we've only lost one mob in VT in the first two weeks, and it was that. And um, I, when I read about it, I was like, not even mad. I was like, well, we told you guys this would happen. Now you'll take it seriously because that's what it takes with people, you know. Yeah, you can only theorize so much. Um, you got to see it in action, and I think everybody saw it. And not only that, but our comp was not was not ready for that either. Um, remember, people are coming from the Velios raid scene where bring your DPS and very minimal support, right? Super minimal support. And a lot of that support is boxed um, because we're doing head to head DPS races. This is going to be a little different when you push mini like that, you're compiling ads and I'm sure people are pulling ads from any, which direction. Like I said, training's fine in those scenarios. As far as I'm concerned, the other guild just has to deal with it. We weren't set up to deal with it. We had one shaman down there. 
like literally one shot. So people learn that we need to have a force there that can take on a bunch of ads. And what did we do right after that? Back to EQ being about planning. We brought people in and we made pulls where we purposefully pulled 30 mobs. Like this one pull, it had 29 mobs we pulled and we took care of it. We got them slowed, we got them tanked and everybody's ready for the massive train shit show that BT is going to turn into now. Yeah. And uh, so before Luckland even launched, we took the whole guild and we practiced a bunch of the VT skips. So for people who don't know, uh, Vexthal or VT is a zone with a notorious quantity of trash. It takes It's like like double the NTOV trash, you know what I mean? And um, over the years, players have found all these little ways to skip around the geometry of the zone. And I'm sure you can call it and if something I think people should exploit. Um, it's, you know, the player should have creative use of mechanics and it's up to the development team to prohibit what they truly care about. So I don't feel bad talking about it. But anyway, these these skips have been reported to the dev team. My understanding is that they cannot change zones from, they can't edit zones from pre-GOD eras. They can't edit them at all unless they revamp the zone, which they know everyone kind of hates at this point. So they're not doing that. So there's like a few little minor solutions they've tried to add to VT. Like you'll run into some spots during these skips and just ports you to the zone line. But uh, basically the metagame of Vexthal doing it quickly is being able to pop all over the, the zone, running on like invisible walls and cracks in the geometry to get to places. And we made a big effort to teach our guild in mass how to do a number of these. There are some that are quite difficult to master and we don't expect people to, to be able to reproduce those. Um, and those are the ones that you make sure that you've got a few key mages who could do. Um, but there are, are like three or four that all of our members are basically expected to do. And we'll say like, hey, um, they'll be like, hey, can I get a cough? And we're just like, no, <laughs> you know what I mean? You could wait and we'll after the raid, we could practice it with you. Because we're we're not going to cough you unless you're a cleric, then we'll cough you. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, no, I mean it's um, the zone is pretty fascinating to me. I mean it's it's basically unfinished, um, and just like everything in EverQuest, anyone who's played EverQuest a long time knows you. It's part of the charm of the game too. To be honest, is some of the geometry and some of the, the glitchiness of it and pathing or whatever have you. You learn little tricks, right? And the tricks in BT are you can run along fake walls that are seemingly not there but they are there and you can kind of maneuver over the zone and get to certain spots um the extent to which you can do it really depends on how good you are it's all about keeping your altitude um today i would i would, I would go so far as to say the extent that you could do it isn't even known right now we so we discovered a new tech just planning for luckland that i'm i'm a thousand percent positive our competition doesn't know about it because they have been crying about us warping ever since they've oh, seen they the results of our of our new skip and uh, I'm pretty confident that nobody used it before us. Like, I think it's a brand new discover in faceless kind of skip in, in VT. And I bet you there's like a dozen more of those that no one knows about and are just waiting to be discovered by some uh, person on test server. I wouldn't be surprised at all because, um, yeah, the, I got so today we had uh, a race. Basically, uh, our I had the jump on a tier two mob. Um, so we, we left what it was a DXV, right? Yeah. DXV. Yeah. So we left DXV up overnight. Cause we had like, what, what do we have? Like five bat phones overnight last we, night, four or five bat phones. Like, like, yeah, we killed a bunch of crap. Um, and then so. DXV spawns and we're like, eh, we're just going to leave that. So it was up for like six hours or so. And then RI bat phoned it and they're in the zone moving on this DXV, which they warped to by, by the way, yes, um, yeah. when DXVT spawns and that's a tier one mob changes the whole thing. We're like, Oh, we're not about to let them just have that for free. So go ahead, Sloan. Yeah. So basically, um, like Zade said, we killed a bunch of targets yesterday, just more than you should in a day. And, uh, I was very tired. Um, so I decided I was going to sleep in today. And uh, shout out to Valia for pinging me about 37 times, um, which woke me up. Also, Zaid, you coming in the channel, helped. And when I woke up, came in, saw the situation, basically what had happened is they were at the tier two, tier one popped, and they started coughing. And when I got in is when they had started coughing. So basically, I got there. 
uh, jumped down there um, using the skips, and they ended up wiping uh, at the window. Um, I won't get into the window and the different spots. And when they started recovering, um, I saw their mage actually just warp, literally warp right back, right? Right. So there's, there's no one in their team there. There's no one to cough them. Yes. And and the reason I know they were warping is because I got tells afterwards saying that the only reason I got there was because I warped. Um, so they're sitting there thinking that I'm doing the same thing they're doing, right? When really we're using that geometry trick to get to that spot, which is not breaking any rules whatsoever. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know. It, it's not going to get you suspended. It's not yeah. egregious enough to get you in trouble, but I'm sure if like J Chan was sitting next to you, she would tell you to knock that off. Uh, if, if they told us to knock it off and that applied to both guilds, I would happily do it. Um, right. It's a, it's a competitive, I don't like a situation where one guild has a competitive advantage because they do something the other guild cannot, right? Right. I would say we're not cheating is how I would, yeah. As, as long as the rules are the same for both sides, um, that that's all I care about. If both sides can take it to a certain limit and that's the limit, that's fine. And that that's why when it comes to warping, I, I really have zero tolerance. I mean, training, all that other shit, as you heard me say, I don't care. Like whatever, yeah. fair game competition if you're all bound by the same rules, right? Yeah, and, um, and so it was Burgers there who was the the yes. warp mage, and then he would cough the other mages to the warp spot, mm -hmm. and then they would cough the rest of the raid normally, right? Yeah, basically, yeah. So yeah, so they warped in, um, tried to recover. We were at a different spot, and I had pre-planned this because I knew what was going to happen. I knew it would turn into a train just shit show. So the spot that I had um, got to, once again, using the geometry tricks, no warping, they were not able to get to. Um, it was behind a wall, behind a zone wall. And uh, they were also behind a zone wall, but they were on top of a windowsill, which is the known spot. This was a new spot that I got to, which is why they accused of warping, right? Um, and because they could not get into that wall, because it's behind the world technically, um, they couldn't train us in there. So we could easily cough our forces. At one point, we had six mages coughing compared to their like two or three maybe. So we got a massive force up there and the second they dropped down from that outside of the world windowsill where they were, we cut a corner, popped inside the world, and we out DPS them. And then they just gave up. They didn't even go for that tier two that they left, and we just took the tier two. And I mean, it was it's it's funny because apparently a GM showed up right after that and suspended two of their mages for warping, but they didn't suspend the mage that was actually warping. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I heard. It's it's um, I, look, I don't know if that's true or not. I, I think that's what um, or I said was that basically, the mage that was cheating, and which is funny because they actually admitted the cheating, um, uh, was not the one that got suspended, but the uh, two that the cheating mage caught were the ones that got suspended, and they were mad about it. And it's like why, I, I believe that. Mad? I believe that one hundred percent. Having dealt with EQ GMs, like a lot of these GMs are not EverQuest players. They don't know what the fuck's going on. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, and in, in my mind, it's like, how can you, you, you literally just admitted to doing something outside of the bounds of the normal competition. Who cares if it was two mages or your whole guild at that point? I mean, you guys are just cheating. Um, that's how I, how I look at it, at least. But yeah, it's like, it's been funny because since Luckland started, they've been so fixated on this idea that we're warping around VT. I've never they, used any, pro, I, dude, I come from P99. I, I never touched anything. <laughs> well, what we're going to do, Sloan, is is like week seven or eight of Luckland, we're just going to drop a video of, of all the skips, including all the new skips that we have. Oh, we're and we'll, the in ones? the video, we'll execute like every skip three times in a row so that we can prove that we're able to do it with uh, relative consistency, you know what I mean? Because that's one of the arguments. Like, yeah, maybe you could do it, but you're way too consistent at it, so it has to be a warp. Shut the fuck up. Um, they posted a, a clip of Bigger's Twitch stream where we're like on a ceiling, on a roof, basically of a building over Otten, and they're like, there's no way you could get there without warp. And I'm like, do you think you think we're just tw like Twitch streaming warps? Like, first, you think we're warping, and second, you think we would be so dumb that we would just put it on stream? I mean... I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, and it was in a DZ too. Like, yeah, I can that, get there. I can get there uh, in about thirty seconds without using any third-party programs, any cheating. I can get there in thirty seconds. That is fast. So I I did a video on test the other day, and I I got from the zone line to Otten's roof in three minutes. But you know, I'm I'm a scrub at these. I, I spent you know back to the preparation thing. That's why I love this game. Um. I, you know how much time I spent in VT. I, I made a test character, a heroic character named Sloan VT, <laughs> and I stayed in there for a week. You remember that? 
before uh, Lucan launched. So I, yeah. I learned everything just perfectly. And uh, yeah, I can maneuver that zone. Just I can get anywhere. So that was one of the reasons why they were trying to send me tells about warping is they didn't understand how fast I was getting back to them. Yeah. Um, Cause Sloan is bound outside and I was literally just pinging back and forth in coughing people. If someone would die, I'd be back in my spot within 15 seconds. And in their mind, cause they were warping, which they admitted the only way I could be doing it was warping. Right. The thing is weird dude is like, they've got showy cube maps. I'm sure. Right. They've got MQ maps if they're actually cheating. So they could see your character moving around. They know you're not warping. They're watching you run. It's super obvious when someone's doing this stuff because you're running around the the zone. You know what I mean? Like you're you're outside the geometry very plainly. So it has to be visually distinct when you're when you're doing these runs um, that they know you're not warping because a warp you would just appear in one spot and then boom you're in a different spot. Yeah, I honestly don't know. The only thing you need to do these skips is just Brie Walls. You can't do it without Brie Walls. You need a functional map uh, that shows you the, the zone layout. Um, yeah. But if you have that, that's all you need. And you don't really see other people on that. But um, I mean, I'd assume that they'd be able to see what I was doing. I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't. If they're using, if they're already warping and using those programs, why wouldn't they be using programs to, to watch, right? I mean, every every guild's going to have a million people in it using Show EQ. I'm sure there's people on both sides who who could see, you know, plainly who's warping and who's not. So, I I don't know. It's weird. I think, you know, when you do something a certain way for so long, and someone else is performing similarly, you just assume they're doing the same thing that you're doing, and that's what it's, what it really is. It's like these guys are warping their mages around, and this is actually I think the first time that we've ever seen like real deal warping in a raid context antique right i've never seen it in a raid context um until today yeah I, I've, I've seen it in a non-raid contest context like when people were racing like for metal pipes on mischief or something right Obviously, yeah but, like, like boxers that. pull out some crazy shit sometimes yeah yeah but i've never seen it in a raid context until today when i saw that mage just pop in front of me just out of nowhere i was just like yeah that's that's it um but look i don't like you said before, I, I, I don't get it. Like it has to just be laziness because they don't have to do that shit. They're, they're not bad. They're good players. Like if they put in the time to strategize and plan, they could be just as good as we are right now, but they're taking the easy route and you know, it's unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, you, they, they do this. That is a guild that is just a perennial TLP recycling guild. So they do Luckland every year. I think last year they died in the beginning of Luckland, so they didn't get to do it that time. And maybe before that was Viniki. So, I mean, maybe they haven't done it as recently as I as I was kind of imagining. But they they do this almost every single year. So you would think that they would know it inside out. But I guess they they found a technique that worked, and they were not pressured by outside forces to improve on that technique. Is what we'll say. Yes, yeah, so that's another thing. How many times have like you guys went? This is my first time, you know, doing this in a TLP um, in Faceless. Um, when I was in RI and Vaniki, Faceless wasn't there. So there was no like real competition. Well, um, well, Bind Rush was created as a as a triple guild kind of thing. It was like at the time we were in the process of absorbing RI on mischief. And part of that absorption was planning a united Vaniki thing, which became Bind Rush, and that was like Thraka, Mabu, and me. And so a lot of the uh, the big faceless guys were in bind rush at first, but they were like like Seeger and and the faceless crew were like killing Talon Zek <laughs> and and Pop while Bind Rush was still bat phoning Comp Two trash mobs basically in in Surat Temple. And uh, as far as I understand, is like Seeger just got kicked out of the guild for for doing that because they were butthurt. I, and I, I never even played. I never even played on Vaniki because I was so focused on Mischief at the time. Mischief was still super competitive between uh, Faceless and Gig at that time because it was like GOD omens for us. Yeah, I do remember that we um, basically Mabu had us in uh, Cessera because he wanted to get the first M server M kill, essentially. And we were there for like five, six days, like literally 24-7 trying to, to rush it. I was in there watching for other guilds, reporting if other guilds zoned in. Um, and the funny part was because Viniki was, you know, a couple expansions ahead at some point, you don't need the M key anymore to zone it, to go in the portal. And after a week of us farming, it hit that expansion point where you didn't need the key. So we'd all got our keys ready to go in after a week of farming 24 seven. And we found out we don't even need these fucking keys. We could have been in here like days ago. 
It was very comical. Yeah. Yikes. But having said that, like I said, nothing but respect. I, I don't, the guy's a fighter, uh, Mabu Vicious, whatever his name is. And um, so is the other guy, Joker. And they showed that in Velios. And I'm glad they're starting to come out now. And I hope they come out more. Um, I would honestly get bored. Um, as you know, I'm not like a big private instance kind of guy. Um, so yeah, hopefully they show up more and try to turn these numbers around. Cause right now it's not looking very hot for them. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny cause we, we were expecting that they would come out suddenly with like an army and they would dominate for like a weekend before we could, we could catch up to the meta, yep. but it's been much more of like a trickle back in. Uh, yeah, you know? it's, they're very selectively targeting things and like i said they should have done this in vilios when they started losing they shouldn't have just hit the brick wall like they did over and over again so yeah, i think it, they, they realize that and you know there's going to be propaganda out there they're going to say shit like oh it's the, the second life bonus is going to make so much loot this isn't about loot I, I don't care about loot the people that are hyper competitive doing this bat phoning at 2 a.m they're not doing it for the loot they're doing it because they like the game they like the competitive nature and they like winning in the game um so none of that really matters doesn't resonate with me and that's why that one video from uh what's his name eighth um just is nonsense to me because it's it's not the loot that matters it's it's the fight so yeah well you know it's it's funny because like we think about it like we do dz's on uh sunday and monday nights and every sunday and monday there's always some important thing in window and we just have to say like hey if it spawns we're just going to take the l on it because we're not going to drop a dz where we're getting literally 20 tier one kills in three hours to go kill one t1 mob you know what i mean we're not going to disrupt the flow of the whole guild for that and it sucks but like if you only care about loot dz's are where you maximize loot open world is not really it yeah no you're right and i mean it, it kills me whenever we have to do that i, I die inside because i just that's not the gamer i am but i realize that in life just like in games, you have to make compromises <laughs> and that is the better thing for the guild. Um, and that's the end goal here is the longevity and doing what's right for the guild. Um, so the crazy so thing is, I think that it's also like, it's it's tactically bad, but like you're saying, better for the guild. Strategically, it's good even for open world because if we if we did it, like let's say that every time something popped while we were in our DZs, we, we fucked over the DZs and we went and did the open world thing. I think our roster would be in a much worse spot and it would make these open world contests far frequent, far, far more frequently, not in our favor. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's, it's um, just like a weird calculus you got to do. It is. Yeah. And, and especially for, for faceless, I mean, um, faceless is much more organized from, from my experience, having been in, in both, you know, leadership groups, um, much more organized, um, much more momentum based and much less akin to wanting things to be chaotic in that sense. Um, whereas RI, they seem to thrive in just screwing as much shit up as they can. Um, even if they have no chance of winning something, it's just what they like doing. So for yeah. them, dropping a DZ, coming to fuck around an open world, even if they're going to lose, it's it's kind of just their MO. It's what they do. Um, but I think that's part of the reason why they can't really keep a force outside of their core people. They're not thinking about their guild, <laughs> if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I mean, th now they're they're recruiting in like general chat and OOC and shit. Yeah. I mean, you gotta you gotta think about the people that aren't your core. I mean, you gotta grow the guild. You gotta keep it alive that way. It's your your core is gonna start dying out. They're gonna get older. They're gonna have kids. Something's gonna happen, and you need new people in. And they're just not not good at that. From what I what I'm gathering and what I'm yeah. seeing here at least. I mean, so one of the things I always think about, because people, you know, for, so, since 2011, people have been calling Faceless a Zerg when Zerg was 50 people instead of 20 people. And um, th the way I think about it these days is just like, there is no guild on Teak. There's no like guild that advertises. There's there's basically like small mans that are strict, but there's no guild, real guild on Teak, traditional guild on Teak that has incredibly strict recruitment standards, Right. If I made a character, if I made a level 60 cleric, I could join any and every guild on Teak tomorrow and I would not get rejected. They would take me 100%. Even if I if I came in and they want to do, maybe they want to do an interview, right? If I came in and I was a jackass in the interview, I'd probably still get in as a 60 cleric. You're just yeah, going to get in. Cleric, yeah. If, yeah. If, if it's, you're it's, 60 it's, cleric, you're going, you're getting into any guild. I mean, it's not. <laughs> right. Um, especially if like you're highly active, you can you can just get coughed everywhere. I mean, either one of us, RI or 
uh, faceless. I mean, we'll just, you know, we'll take a cleric, even if they can't do the jumps, we'll cough them. I mean, right. The, the so biggest we'll, issue is those 2 a.m. to, you know, 8 a.m. spawns. I mean, if you have a cleric who's active those times, that, that person is, is gold. So what, what I'm getting at here, though, is like when we think of a Zerg guild, right? Like we call faceless a Zerg, which we are. We are the, the this faceless is the biggest faceless I've ever been in. And there's no and such every, thing as a Zerg. I mean, it, it's not. It's 72 versus 72. Yeah, it's, it's the wrong way to look at it. And like, so put it in this perspective, those Velios races, we were pulling like 110 people, right? And our eye was barely pulling a full 72 man, right? Yeah. If we didn't pull that other 30 um, and we just had a pure DPS raid, what would happen? Everyone's time would have been just put down the fucking drain because we would have sat there at odds looking at each other, wondering who's going to make the first move, right? So yeah. us having another 20, 30 people, having a couple warriors, shaman, clerics, all that stuff to make a support raid allowed those things to go a lot faster. Uh, otherwise, think of, um, you know, Avatar of War. Who's going to kill Idol and Statue? It was always us. And the reason is because we had more people, right? Well, what's the argument? If we didn't have those other people that we would lose? Well, no, not necessarily. We still have DPS them with the 70 percent DPS raid. Yeah. So I'm just, it was a very strange argument that started coming up, um, ironically, right when they started losing. Yeah. Um, that we're some kind of Zerg. It's, yeah, I mean, my experience was the opposite. I mean, Kunark, they were pulling double the people. I, I never once said, hey, this is a Zerg guild. It's just, they're winning. <laughs> and when you're right. winning, you have more people come on. Right. I mean, for me, it's just like, dude, every player who wants to join a guild on Teak, can, they have every guild available to them. And they're choosing Faceless more often than they're choosing any other guild. And there's a reason that that is happening, Right. Oh, 100%. I mean, I, I've been keeping a close eye on, you know, our eyes, people showing up. As you know, I do all the number crunching, the parses afterwards and competitive fights. So I'm familiar with the names and I don't see many new names there. Um, and when I do, um, I check them out, you know, in game and their boxes typically. Right. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I saw a ranger literally today, all right, box ranger in Kunark gear. Like, it's, yeah. like, what are they going to do with these rangers that we have that have an extra 150 attack gear? It's, it's not going to be close, right? Right. Um, like faceless, but, we don't, we don't have recruitment officers. We have application processing officers and we got like fucking four of them and they're busy because people are beating down the door to join the guild all the time all the time yeah, people that, are trying to join the, is the amount of new people like i'd say like if i were looking at the beginning of velios and right now the people coming to open worlds i would put at least 33 percent um are new people that were not there in velios whereas our i side not the case yeah uh, and, and that's the biggest issue the biggest issue is the burnout and maintaining the people yeah, so, I mean, you gotta you gotta have a positive atmosphere. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't even want to get into that. I mean, I could say some things about that, but you know, teach their own on how they want to let their guild, you know, interact and with, say what they want in their channels. I mean, we have a special channel in our Discord for people that want to do that stuff, and I avoid it. Um, Brain cell uh, crematorium, baby. <laughs> I, I just I'm too competitive, and if I go in there and someone has a different view than me, I'm just gonna waste way too much time. I'd rather waste that time learning how to navigate VT or something like. Yeah, I don't even. I don't, I don't open the channel unless I need to go like put somebody in timeout. Yeah, um, it's, but, you know, like I don't know. You, you don't. No one knows what it's like in the other guild when you lose, right? But I know when we lose, we're like, shit. All right, well, what did we do wrong? Like we immediately are just workshopping the solution to that. There's no yelling. There's no like anger. We we don't have. Uh, I would say there's like just not a lot of negative sentiment when we lose. No, there isn't. And I mean, you know, those 25, 30 people that were showing up in Kunark, those people are still here, minus maybe one or two people that took a break. But most of them, 90% are still here. Right. You go like through, Prax, man. Uh, yes, Prax is a hero. Um, when you go through that type of defeat, because we were getting defeated um, quite a bit there. Uh, granted, you know, we did win that one server respawn. Like, that was a, we smoked them. Um, but on the normal open world spawns, for whatever reason, they were winning, right? Um, those same people kept showing up, those same people kept showing up and those same people are still here. And that's the important part is losing as a way of getting better. Um, P99, once again, I know, uh, you TLP guys don't like it, but, uh, I'm <laughs> talking about it, but, um, we went through months of just getting shit on by TMO and, you know, we learned basically. And if you can't learn from your mistakes, your, your guild's not going anywhere. Yeah. So Sloan, I, what do you, as we get closer to wrapping this up, where do you see Luckland going in terms of competition between the, the two guilds? What, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think, uh, I think someone told you they were going to get 75% of all raid mobs. Do you think that's going to happen or is it too late? <laughs> um, I don't think that's going to happen. 
um, unless it's faceless at this point. I, I'm pretty sure if we at at this next Monday, if we just stop doing open world, it would still you know we've already we'll have done 25 percent of all the raid mobs already. So yes, and you know you get into stupid shit like people saying oh tier one, tier two, and you have all these different you know metrics, right? Like um, oh another thing we haven't talked about. Um, quick shout out to uh, Queen OCI Club. Um, they did awesome on the launch as well. Um, they did phenomenal. Uh, yeah, actually, surprised. big props to them. I, I was like, they could have beat us. Granted, we did slow down. We knew there wasn't competition. Nah. But, you know, the, it, <laughs> uh, we slowed down quite a bit. Like we could have, we could have went a lot faster, right? No, um, yeah, we 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 slowed down. We slowed yeah. up down two two times for two different reasons. We slowed down one time, like you talked about, because we were we saw no competition on the horizon. We we yes. slowed down initially to be careful because we expected competition that never arrived. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. So, you know, if, if we knew we were head on racing, we would have probably beat even that record we made by an hour and a half, two hours, um, to be honest. But yeah, yeah that we went had- super fast. And, you know, the reason I'm bringing that up is, you know, some people will like, oh, you know, number one, number two, and, you know, set their metric as this or that. I mean, the metric in Lukeland is clear. It's killing on Hara. I mean, it's not. In Velios, it was so ambiguous. And that's why that stupid nonsense about, you know, that video we were talking about and those other things. Yeah. Um, were there, right? Um, as right. far and as I mean, every MMO expansion for every game ever, the the winner is the person who kills the final boss first. Yes, and then then you have another metric, which now is open world kills, right? So you can look at it in terms of total kills. You can look at it in terms of competitive kills. Um, funny twist is, even though we smoked them at competitive kills in Velios, right now we're neck and neck in competitive kills. Even though it's a very small sample size, it's literally like what six or seven kills, like four. Yeah, right? Four yeah, kills, we're right? basically tied. Yeah. So too small to really say anything about. I think that's that's interesting. Um, but it it's because, because they're being far more selective with their targets. Exactly. Like you talked about, like they they come to targets only when they sense weakness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like fucking 6 a.m. cursed. Yes. Yeah. Um, so or, or you know, that on Hara where or the, the mini that is where they uh, had that plan to push um, to exploit the uh, the mob resetting. Right. Yeah, uh, if they, they, keep, if they doing, keep doing stuff like today's High Priest, where they just come to a prime time tier two mob in in a, a zone that you can't even train us in, that that head to head count is going to go a lot more in our favor. They, they, that's the issue, and in, in looking forward in Lukeland is I, I think hitting the brick wall in Vilios burnt out a lot of their people. They're not putting up the numbers. They can't win DPS races. Um, yeah. So they're going to try to do things like they did on Mini, exploit the geometry in VT to reset bosses. Um, train that kind of stuff right um some of that stuff's okay you know as long as it's not getting into using third-party stuff like they did today um but yeah i i just i don't know it could could go any which way i mean i think they'll continue selectively doing it and i think their plan is to try to build momentum off of winning select fights right um that's a good plan it, it is it's what they should do but the, the problem is they have to win them <laughs> so um the problem Assessment. is it takes it takes like a little bit of humility to make that call consistently, right? Because ego makes you want to press the bat phone every time a mob pops. Yes, and that's that's another fundamental issue, I think, with them in terms of maintaining members. You'll have some shitty people out there who are just shitty people all around. But for the most part, maybe I'm naive, but I like to think when it comes down to a lot of people are, are good, decent people and can see through bullshit. And um, when we lose, we say good game. Um, I, I will talk to them about any kind of competitive thing they want in a cordial way as a competitor. Uh, not so much on their side. They they take it way too personally and they get way too heated about us being, you know, their enemies and almost like it's in, in real life. Like I'd be afraid of meeting these people in real life. I mean, I put them down, of course, but well, they, they couldn't catch you. <laughs> they, could, they wouldn't catch you, Sloan. Don't worry. <laughs> what I'm saying is like if I met them in real life, I would have a beer and I'd have fun with them. Uh, you know, like I don't think the feeling is mutual, which is sad. Yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah, I don't know. We don't, we don't talk a lot of shit. We discourage our members from talking shit. They talk a lot of shit and it's just whatever. I think I like that they talk shit because it keeps our folks motivated. Yeah. And, yeah. As uh, long they, as it they talk shit when they lose, they talk shit when they win. I mean, look, what I'm getting at is more so, you know, there were some people that made comments about your family and stuff like that. And, and that shit is just like, what is, like, is this all you have in life? Like, why, why are you taking it so personal? Yeah, um, rarely see that going the other way is what I'm getting at. Well, yeah, as far as Lukeland and how it's going to go, I mean, I think they're going to selectively hit shit and 
try to build momentum off of that. And if they get a couple wins in a row, um, I'm sure they will gain momentum. And I hope yeah. they keep coming because um, this game has been played for so long. Everyone knows the content. Doing this content alone, I don't know about later expansions, but right now it's not hard. It's extremely easy. Um, it never gets hard. It really doesn't. What makes it hard and interesting to me is being in the same zone as another guild and having to devise, you know, best plans of mice and men, right? You can plan all you want. Um, the other guys can plan all they want. When it gets into a, uh, you get into a fight, things have to change on the fly. And yeah. that's one part of whatever quest uh, competition for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's well said. And I think it's probably a good place to leave it off. Sloan, we'll, we'll pick it back up maybe uh, maybe a couple of weeks after Pop Launch or maybe the last week of Luckland in the Sea where things fell out. But yeah, yeah this has been happens. a lot of fun. For me, it's been a privilege to have you on our team. You've been great and have been instrumental in our success on, on this server. So thanks a ton, man. Yeah, no, thank you for uh, giving me a chance to get back into competitive EQ. I mean, it's uh, I love the game and we'll see where it goes. Oh, hey, should we tell should we tell people about our, our secret plan? Which secret plan? We have many. The, the secret plan, like we're gonna keep me and you are gonna keep rolling on uh each TLP as it comes out and making making pure open world guilds. Yeah, no, I'm all for it. I mean, um, you know, like I said, I took the ten year break. I got everything in my real life situated to the point where I can be a degenerate again and do two AM, three AM bat phones. Um, nothing's stopping me and I plan on doing it the next couple TLPs, hopefully under faceless and uh, just hitting open world hard and you know, taking it over. That's that's the best part to think about this. Like, not only is it happening here, how we we're having a good time, but it's never going to stop. <laughs> and with that, that was Drama Quest, folks. Have a good night.